Today's video is sponsored by The Daily Upside, a totally free, high-quality daily business and finance newsletter. Visit the link in the description to learn more. So, Japan intervened in the currency markets yesterday to strengthen the yen for the first time since 1998. They did this after the currency fell to a 24-year low, after the Bank of Japan said that they would stick with their ultra-loose monetary policy. So let's discuss this intervention and what it means within the context of Japanese economic history. We'll look at the post-war Japanese economic miracle, the bubble economy of the late 1980s, and the lost decades that Japan has experienced since. We'll also discuss any overlaps between the Japanese economic miracle and the last 30 years of growth that has been seen in China, and discuss to what extent history could repeat itself. Now, to give you some background on this video, I've been thinking quite a bit about the Japanese economy recently, particularly after making my video on the 1987 crash. In researching that video, I came across an article by George Soros on the causes of the crash. And in his piece, which was written in March 1988, he argued that the 87 crash related to a transfer of financial and economic power in the global economy from the United States to the new economic superpower, Japan. Essentially, that the world was moving away from the US dollar to the Japanese yen as a reserve currency, and that the US was experiencing a national identity crisis as it slid into second place. I'm not here to point out a mistake made by one of the most successful investors in history, as obviously he has been right much more than he's been wrong in terms of investment, and his returns do clearly show that. But it's interesting to look at the parallels, especially as we can see that China has mimicked many of the strategies that caused huge growth in Japan in the post-war period. China is, of course, fortunate to be able to learn from the example of Japan, so we shouldn't expect history to precisely repeat itself. Hopefully, by examining some of this history, we can learn something too. That's why I find this topic so interesting. So let's start with the Japanese economic miracle, which refers to the period of rapid economic growth between the post-World War II era and the end of the Cold War. During this period, Japan transformed from an entirely collapsed economy to being the world's second largest economy, right behind the United States. Now, most countries did experience significant industrial growth in the post-war period, but the countries that saw the biggest drops in industrial output due to war damage, like Japan, West Germany and Italy, also achieved the most rapid recoveries after the war. The Japanese economy was in ruins at the end of the Second World War. Nearly four years of bombing had wiped out the majority of Japan's industrial capacity. Its major cities, including Tokyo and of course Hiroshima and Nagasaki, lay in ashes. 93% of the country's steel production had been obliterated. Japan's GNP stood at under half its peak from before the war. By 1946, Japan was on the verge of famine, which was only avoided due to American shipments of food. Japan was then occupied by American soldiers until 1952, but a mere 30 years later, the Japanese economy was number two in the world, just behind the United States. There are six major factors that can be used to explain the Japanese economic miracle. Number one, at the end of the war, the United States pushed for war reparations to be minimized for Japan. They did this to prevent a repeat of what had happened with Germany at the end of the First World War. On top of this, Japan gave up the right to use any military force after the war, instead relying on the United States for protection. Japan had previously spent massively on its military, so eliminating this significant expense allowed Japan to put all of its strength and resources into reconstructing the economy. 
Number two, the United States encouraged Japan's integration into global commerce, which opened markets for the country's exports. In 1955, Japan became a member of the tariff-cutting General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, or GATT. Number three, the Korean War. From 1950 to 1953, the United States was involved in the Korean War. It turned to Japan for procurement of equipment and supplies. This was necessary as the logistics of shipping goods from home was quite expensive. Japan's industry was soon providing the munitions, food and war materials to the American forces fighting in Korea, and this demand boosted the Japanese economy, enabling it to recover quickly from the Second World War. It provided the basis for the rapid expansion that was to follow. Number four, in late 1950, following a similar policy change in Germany, Japan began cutting taxes. Tax policy changed from its prior focus on redistributing and equalizing incomes to a focus on boosting production instead. The highest individual income tax rate was cut from 86% to 55%. Between 1950 and 1974, Japan reduced taxes every year but one by either increasing the income thresholds at which higher tax rates applied or by enlarging tax deductions and exemptions. The country also cut its tariffs on imported goods. As an example, the tariff on imported cars fell from 40% to 10%. This meant that it was now cheaper to import foreign technology, which translated into economic growth over time. Number five, embracing competition. After the war, large Japanese conglomerates were broken up. An anti-monopoly law was passed to prohibit all cartel activities, and a decentralization law was created to force firms to reduce in size if any single company had market control. Japanese firms were forced to compete with each other, and this internal competition made them stronger and better able to compete internationally. Last, we have the Japanese Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Japan. After the war, Japan was in a terrible state, and the banks were sitting on loans that were worthless. Loans that had been made to destroyed factories or relating to overseas assets that they no longer controlled. The law for the reconstruction and reorganization of financial institutions in 1946 required banks to write off loans made to insolvent companies and worthless overseas investments, but allowed them to deduct the losses from profits, capital, frozen deposits, and if necessary, free deposits. This meant that banks got rid of these assets and eliminated comparable liabilities, emerging much smaller but sounder. At this point in time, Japanese companies desperately needed capital to rebuild, and there was very little capital to go around. The only way to access capital was to go to these banks for loans. The use of banks as capital purveyors in the post-war period went well beyond prior levels in Japanese history. The fact that the only real source of capital was the banking system led to a system of credit rationing and government control of industrial policy known as window guidance. Echoes of this system can be found today in Chinese monetary policy. The window guidance approach involved the use of monetary policy instruments, including lending quotas, as a semi-informal way to subsidize or regulate the volume of credit in an industry or financial sector. Instead of the central bank just setting the price of money, which is the interest rate, they would also decide on the quantity of credit and which businesses it would be lent to. Essentially, the Bank of Japan would give Japanese banks quotas as to how much credit should be extended to various industries. This worked quite efficiently in Japan due to the rigidly compartmentalized banking system, where banks were divided up by funding source, by activity, and by geography. So the Bank of Japan had huge control over the banking system and thus the whole economy. 
The nature of window guidance meant that the Bank of Japan could decide which projects should be encouraged and which should be discouraged. And they did this by deciding which companies and industries could get loans. This was a centralized war economy system adapted to the production of consumer goods. A variety of other policies both assisted and protected companies in Japan during this period, including trade barriers and an exchange rate that discouraged imports and promoted exports. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But it meant that Japanese consumers were stuck paying high prices and their incomes were lower than in the West. So while large Japanese corporations grew in leaps and bounds, their employees and the rest of society made do with relatively low living standards. This war economy style system didn't mean that shareholders did that well either, as businesses in Japan didn't compete to generate profit, they instead competed to grow market share. This grew the Japanese economy hugely. In 1959 alone, the economy expanded by 17%. And by the mid-1960s, the term excessive competition had been coined to describe Japanese businesses that would fight until bankruptcy for market share with no real concern for profitability. By 1968, Japan had become the second largest economy in the world, quite a transformation. Japanese corporations soon became dominant in many markets, and Americans, of course, took notice. In 1981, a congressional hearing was held with the title Japanese Productivity Lessons for America. Newspapers at the time were filled with articles on the Japanese miracle economy. Businessmen signed themselves and their children up for Japanese lessons. A common explanation by economists at the time was that a good education system and innovative management drove high Japanese productivity, and high Japanese productivity explained the impressive performance of Japan's economy. Books on Japanese management techniques became international bestsellers at the time. In reality, though, Japan's phenomenal performance, especially in the 1980s, had very little to do with management techniques. A sharply undervalued currency and low interest rates helped to generate tremendous economic growth, but of course at a cost. Japan keeping its currency weak made its exports more competitive in global markets and also made imported goods more expensive in Japan. This boosted Japanese export volume and spurred economic growth. But in order for a central bank to keep its currency weak, they need to suppress consumption within their own country and use the accumulated savings to buy up the reserve currency or the US dollar. The reserve currency country, who's allowing their currency to float freely based on supply and demand, must absorb those excess savings, essentially by issuing bonds. And then this money finances the excess consumption, buying cheap imported goods or investment. So if foreign central banks pursue a strategy of suppressing their currency and buy trillions of dollars of reserve currency government bonds, the issuer of the reserve currency is then forced to either issue more and more bonds to keep up with demand, increasing their national debt, or they have to allow unemployment to soar. What this means is that the issuer of the reserve currency doesn't get to determine its own savings rate that's one of the costs of issuing the reserve currency. If you find this topic interesting, I have a whole video on it called Weaponizing the Dollar, which you can watch later. So in Japan, much of this growth came with low and declining household consumption as a share of GDP. And because of this strategy, Japan was extremely reliant on exports to generate growth. The rest of the world, and particularly the United States, grew both unable and unwilling to absorb Japan's rising trade surpluses. Ronald Reagan was elected US president in 1980, at a time when the US economy was in recession, unemployment was getting close to 10%, and inflation was high. He pledged that he would do something about the trade deficit with Japan. 
1981, he capped the number of cars that could be imported from Japan each year. In 1983, he put a 45% tariff on large Japanese motorcycles. This was to defend Harley-Davidson, and as you can see, the extra breathing room really allowed them to innovate over the years. In 1987, he put a 100% tariff on Japanese computers, televisions, and power tools, accusing Japanese companies of dumping or selling their goods below market price and refusing to allow American semiconductor producers to sell in Japan. Now, before we look at how Japan responded to this, let me tell you quickly about today's video sponsor, The Daily Upside. If you find yourself sifting through multiple news sources trying to find unbiased and insightful news, The Daily Upside might be the solution to your problem. The Daily Upside is a totally free daily email newsletter written by a team of financial professionals with real industry experience, and it's read by over half a million investors every Every day. It's become the first thing I read every morning, as it's informative, entertaining, and not dumbed down. They give you the most important news with real analysis. They covered the news of Japan's currency intervention in this morning's newsletter, which helped me to prepare for this video. Whether you're a financial professional or just looking for a great source of business news, The Daily Upside will help. It's totally free to sign up and they send you one information-filled email every morning. I can't recommend it enough. Sign up using the link in the description below. So from 1980 to 1985, the US dollar had appreciated by around 50% against the Japanese yen, the Deutsche Mark, the French franc, and the British pound. This caused considerable difficulties for American industry and also for countries that were buying goods from the United States. In September 1985, the finance ministers and central bank governors of the United States, France, Germany, Japan and Great Britain met at the Plaza Hotel in New York City, and they came up with an agreement known as the Plaza Accord. They agreed that global trade was imbalanced and that the dollar was too expensive, and they needed to intervene to rebalance. The reason that the countries who were suppressing their currencies were so quick to agree is just that trade surplus countries tend to have very little bargaining power in a trade war. Japan allowed the yen to soar in value against the US dollar, which should have caused Japan's trade surplus and Japanese growth to fall sharply. But to prevent this from happening, the Bank of Japan cut interest rates and began to significantly increase window guidance loan quotas. Average yearly loan growth quotas were close to 15% in the late 1980s. The credit boom caused not only a boom in real estate, but also in the stock market. Between 1985 and 1989, Japanese stocks rose 240%, barely taking a breath in the 1987 crash. Land prices rose even more, 245% over that four-year period. I'm sure you've all heard the famous example that by the end of the 1980s, the value of the garden surrounding the Imperial Palace in central Tokyo was worth more than the entire state of California. And that was back in the 1980s when I'm told that California was quite nice. As you can see, the combined effects did nothing to resolve Japan's underlying imbalances. In fact, they only made the situation worse. In this new easy credit, low interest rate environment, with asset and stock prices rocketing, the speculative frenzy became so great that Japanese firms began raising capital just to invest in stocks and real estate. It's estimated that almost half of the total reported profits from Japan's largest corporations were derived from stock market investments at the time. The car maker Nissan made more money through speculative investments than through manufacturing cars in the late 1980s. The Bank of Japan, through window guidance, pushed the banks to increase lending such that the only way they could fulfill their loan quotas was through non-productive loans. 
A banker at the time was quoted as saying that banks increased lending even when there was no loan demand. Bankers went from choosing the best borrowers from a large pool of loan applicants to aggressively pursuing potential customers and then encouraging them to borrow money. Even the Japanese public found this strange, dubbing it excess money. With the sudden appreciation of the Japanese yen, the people of Japan had all of a sudden become rich. Foreign goods suddenly seemed cheap to them. Their incomes were no longer suppressed, and they had access to cheap bank loans. In the 1980s, Japanese capital flows flipped from a net inflow of more than $2 billion in 1980 to an outflow of $132 billion by 1986. Assets including art objects and other valuables all over the world became targets for Japanese buyers. Japanese government officials worried about a possible backlash over Japanese speculators turning up in the United States with suitcases of yen, and they warned their citizens to avoid large conspicuous purchases. That didn't work awfully well, as months later Sony Corporation bought up Columbia Pictures and Mitsubishi bought Rockefeller Center, and a Japanese billionaire even bought the Empire State Building. His daughter claimed that he had bought it for her as a birthday present. Low key. Investment can always be expected to cause growth, but malinvestment of the type that happened in the Japanese bubble of the 1980s simply subtracts more growth from the future than it causes in the present. Japan's economy grew massively in the second half of the 1980s, amazing the rest of the world. It appeared to be the only major economy unaffected by the 1987 crash, and many investors at the time were certain that Japan would overtake the United States to be the biggest economy in the world. Most of that huge growth unfortunately came at the cost of sharply worsening imbalances and massively wasted investment. Finally, in 1990, worried about rising risks, the Bank of Japan got around to doing what they should have done years earlier, and they began to raise the cost of capital in an attempt to cool the overheating economy. It was unfortunately too late, as while an economy can appear to grow during a period of malinvestment, it all eventually must be paid for. Japan rebalanced the only way it could, with an even sharper contraction in economic growth. This is the root cause of the lost decades that followed. The lesson of the 1980s is not that Japan should have refused to sign the Plaza Accord, as many will have you believe. The Plaza Accord affected a number of countries, most notably Japan and Germany, but none of the other countries were affected the way Japan was. By 1990, Japan had an inflexible banking system underpinned by government guarantees. It had accrued extreme income imbalances, there had been years of non-productive investment, there was vastly overvalued real estate, and soaring debt. The very factors that caused Japan's bubble as they unwound, led to its difficult adjustment. Many of these issues can be seen in China today, some on an even larger scale, but at least the Chinese government does appear to be trying to cool things down rather than adding fuel to the fire. Japan issued its first government bonds in 1965, beginning a pile of debt that would soon grow to historic proportions. As of 2022, Japanese public debt is estimated to be 12.2 trillion US dollars, or 266% of GDP, the highest of any developed nation. In 1989, 32 of the world's top 50 companies by market cap were Japanese. Today, Toyota is the only Japanese company clinging on in 42nd place. After Japan's economic bubble burst, the country became locked in a vicious cycle of slow growth and deflation, leading to a persistent lack of demand. Deflation is very harmful to an economy, as when people expect prices to fall, they defer spending, harming the economy more. 
Additionally, when people are highly indebted, deflation makes it even harder for them to pay down their debts, as the value of their debt stays the same while their income falls. This of course means that they tighten their belts, spend less, worsening the deflationary spiral. Living standards in Japan remain quite high, but there are all sorts of problems. Japanese corporate culture meant that companies avoided laying off workers, so instead they just cut down on new hires. This meant that young people didn't get good jobs, causing further economic stagnation. Youth unemployment then led to people having less children, causing demographic problems for the country. The Japanese banking system stagnated too, as they had all sorts of bad loans on their books from the 1980s and didn't want to make any new loans, particularly as most of the companies looking to borrow were even riskier due to the faltering economy. The Bank of Japan tried to stimulate the economy by cutting interest rates, even taking them down to zero. They pioneered the strategy of buying government bonds, which is known as quantitative easing. And on top of all of that, the Japanese government spent hugely on public works projects like roads and bridges. But demand spending and borrowing remained stubbornly low. Some blamed the Bank of Japan for not acting more decisively. In November 1997, lines began forming outside the banks in Japan, marking the start of Japan's banking crisis. Over the next year, seven major financial institutions failed, and the crisis only ended after a controversial bailout using taxpayer money. Fortunately, this bailout cleaned up the balance sheets of Japanese banks, making them more likely to work. The Japanese suffered further during the credit crunch in 2008, not because of bad loans, but because Japan relied heavily on exports to the United States and Europe, and consumers in those countries stopped spending. In fact, Japan's economy contracted more than the US economy did over that period. In recent years, Japan went all in with negative interest rates and huge quantitative easing to spur inflation, hoping that it would kickstart the economy. Quantitative easing in Japan has been so extreme that the Bank of Japan owns around 70% of all government debt. They began buying up corporate bonds and even stocks. This program of Abenomics hiked consumption taxes too, hoping to end deflation. The coronavirus pandemic in 2020 delivered another blow to the Japanese economy. The falling yen and surging oil prices have recently pushed Japanese headline inflation to 2.5%. Excluding volatile commodity prices, however, underlying inflation is still weak and there's been no pass-through from rising prices to higher wages. Japan has the opposite problem to most of the rest of the world and is the only country holding on to negative interest rates while the US Federal Reserve and most other major central banks are hiking interest rates to aggressively fight inflation. If you missed my video on the 1987 crash, here's a link. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, The Daily Upside, by clicking on the link in the video description. It's a great newsletter that I can firmly recommend. Have a great day and talk to you again soon. Bye.